Thank you. Well, welcome to the September 9th City Council meeting. Um, work session, actually. This is our first gathering since a long break. The mayor is out of town due to a family emergency, so I will, as council president, I will be acting as mayor. And Emily Semple, who is our vice president, will be acting as council president. And I don't know where vice president is. I guess um, the acting vice president will be Chris. Mm -hmm. Okay, got that all settled. First item is on the agenda is items of interest and committee reports, and I'm going to start that tonight because I have a motion which you all have in front of you. And then we will take the names of other people who wish to speak. Um, I move to direct the city manager to not begin a process for complying with House Bill 2001 and instead work to obtain a legislative repeal of H.R. 2001 during the 2020 legislative session. Second. Okay, thank you. Um, this, this is a state preemption of local control. Uh, the land use is, <clears throat> in my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of other people, including League of Oregon Cities, uh, should be a local matter. Uh, the state, we, we elect the state representatives to help us to do things for us. And things like, for example, taking care of homeless people, mentally ill, things are the kinds of things that the state could help us with because people move from place to place. Our land, however, does not move. It stays right here. And I think it should be in our control and that we should do everything we can to resist the House bill which preempted, attempts to preempt local authority. Mike? Yeah, Betty, I'll vote in favor of that. Um, aside from the issues around its preemption of local control, which I agree with, I mean, our land use system is a statewide system, obviously, but the fine-tuning pieces of it are ours to decide at a local level based on what's right for the people who live in our community. And I agree with you that this is too heavy-handed in a, a change. But as someone who works in this industry, I feel, I want to use the right words here, I, I feel uh, very, very certain that this will make housing much less affordable in our community. The end result of this will be to make housing terribly, terribly more expensive. And I could go through all that, but I'm not going to waste your time. Suffice it to say, happy to if you would like. Or privately or publicly. Um, the, the piece of it that's really troubling, though, for me is that they didn't get a portion of this quite right when, when they did the compromise so that how it addresses how a city measures capacity for housing, um, they put in at the end as kind of an afterthought the alteration of that, and I don't think they got that part quite right. That's the part that will make um, future housing soar in cost, in my opinion, and I think it needs to go back to the drawing board at least for revision of at least that portion where they measure capacity of uh, lands inside a current existing urban growth boundary. So I'll vote in favor. Thank you. Frank. Thanks, Betty. I'm going to take my League of Oregon City's hat off for this, this conversation. Um, you know, we were 7 to 1 against um, House Bill 2000, West, but I'll say 7 and a half um, <laughs> against House Bill 2001. We all know what, the, what it means in terms of local preemption, but the bill passed. It was signed into law by the governor. Um, I don't think that we're going to see a reversal of that legislation in 2020 or even out further than that. I think is the best way that we can handle this is to go forward with complying with the law and then see what happens and where it goes from there. I think there's some triggers inside of House Bill 2001 that will make it difficult for 
uh, municipal municipalities to comply. Um, but in the meantime, um, we have a very short window. I think it's three years to be able to uh, comply with um, House Bill 2001, or else um, our planning department and uh, our land use code is going to be totally screwed up. And so I would, I would, normally I would say, you know, no, I would, I would concur with you, Betty, that you know we should continue to fight this, but I think that the game is already over. And uh, there is no overtime, so I'm going to I'm going to vote against this motion. Chris, there's actually two parts to this motion. Um, <clears throat> the first one, which has been talked about a lot, or the first part, is the part where we don't like the fact that the state passed this, and we don't like the fact that local control has been taken away, and we don't like the fact that um, you know we do, we we can't do this on our own. But there's a second part that is, I think, equally dangerous for us. And that is the part where we don't have a backup plan, where you don't prepare for the eventuality that this is going to be imposed. In other words, you say, well, we're going to work to repeal it, but we're not going to do anything else. So when the time comes, we don't have anything in place. And the state comes in and imposes a state-generated mandate. And that date will be June 20th, 2022. If we do not have a locally compliant version, the state will impose theirs by law, period. So we say, okay, don't worry, we'll have it repealed by then. Can we guarantee we'll have it repealed by then? In 2020, it's only a five-week session. The chance of being able to get something like that through a five-week session is minimal, which means we have to wait till 2021. And then we have to wait till the end of 2021 to see if we can repeal it then. By that time, you will have 12 months to put together a compliant plan or the state comes in and imposes theirs. So if, if, if you want to go down that road of saying, let's have the city manager work to obtain a legislative repeal, you can do that. But to put in not begin a process for complying is foolish. It's crazy. It says we're so confident we'll repeal that we won't do any work, we won't have anything ready, and when June 20th, 2022 rolls around, we'll go, oh, gosh, and the state will, W-I-L-L, -L, impose their plan on us if we don't have one. So I think in this case, I think we should vote against this. If we want to take up the issue about um, opposing 20, 2001, take that up as a separate issue. But this is foolish. Claire. Thank you. So I cannot support the motion, though I do appreciate you having forecasts that you were going to bring it tonight. Um, you know, I spoke passionately to have our lobbyist oppose the bill when it was in the legislature, and I thought that was the correct position. We were being asked, do we want to uh, support it with amendments? And, you know, I felt, no, it's, it's, it wasn't a good bill. We didn't want to support it. We didn't want to impose on us. And, you know, I, I, felt strongly about that and, uh, you know, uh, was part of that seven to half vote. Um, but now that it has been duly passed by the legislature, signed into law, uh, it's, you know, a legitimate law. It's not an illegitimate law that was passed illegitimately. I believe we have an obligation to comply with the mandates of the law. And I think this proposal, um, would create such uncertainty um, around our future land use here locally that would be really detrimental and causing confusion for individual property owners as well as larger developers in terms of those trying to plan for any development in our community. It might just shut it down completely. Um, and I don't think um, that is the right way to go. So I don't also don't see us being successful in bringing, uh, trying to get a legislative repeal for some of the reasons Councilor Pryor spoke to. And I do not believe this effort would be a good, prudent use of our city resources, so I will be voting no. Emily. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I agree with um, many of the other councilors. I also didn't want the, the preemption of our local rule, and I, th I think that's really, really important. But that didn't count. 
the law is now in effect. So I have a couple of questions um, about the motion. I'm not you know, really sure exactly what it means if we did this. Um, how much uh, time does it take to get us to the point where we are complying? And how much time, and I know this is conjecture, would it take to work a, for a repeal? Um, are those both huge? We can't do both. Um, so I'm just wanting a little more insight into that. <laughs> A couple of thoughts on the repeal of the legislation. It would be similar to any other legislation in which we're wanting to have the, our representatives and the state to act upon. And so if this were to pass or a portion of it that talks about legislative, what we would do is get Ethan engaged pretty quickly as the IGR and start mapping out a strategy of how do we actually go about doing that. And um, I don't know exactly what that strategy would be, but that would be sort of the start of the process. And then as we get into the legislative session, uh, that process works itself out like any other legislative piece. On the part of our process for complying with HB 2001, there's a couple pieces for us. One, uh, we are still in the process of wanting to know what the impacts of all of that are on any numbers of planning and land use efforts. And then depending on where council ends up with this particular motion, we will want to get pretty clear clarity on what that means because, uh, for example, ADUs is a part of this and we're coming back next week to talk about that and so is that counted in this or not. Part of it would be as we continue planning processes like River Road Santa Clara, does that mean we put that on hold until we've uh, worked through this or not? I don't know those specific question answers to that, but we would want to know what the intent of uh, the council would be if we move forward on that. Thank you. Um, what will happen while we're waiting, if we decide to ask for a repeal, you know, how many are we going to get sued to death? What what happens? I don't know about the legal remedy. If, if for example, if just the second piece passes and not the first, is that what you're, um, or is it just? I mean. Well, while it's not in effect because we haven't figured out how to comply and we're working on that, and we're also working, pretend, to repeal it, um, what happens to the city while we don't have our, it lined up for how we're going to comply if we do, and um, we're working on this repeal. I know before we were getting sued, so we wanted to get the Luba remand fixed, and this wouldn't seems like it wouldn't fix that problem. So then we're in limbo luba land. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, f for the part that is kind of the bulk of 2001, there you're not out of compliance until June 30th, 2022. So that in the short term, there isn't anything that you could get sued on when it comes to many of the pieces of House Bill 20 of uh, 2001 and what the remedy is as Councilor Pryor said is on June on July 1 they no one needs to sue us they just the state law just applies over top there are other pieces of it which make this complicated and I think um, what John was speaking to is what what the intended scope is is for example there is an ADU component um, that that goes into effect January 1 and that would be part of your discussion coming up and so if um, if in fact the intent of the first part of the motion is to get at that ADU piece then some of the conversation next week can be about well starting January 1 this is now where you're even more out of compliance and that's where you'll see the additional LUBA appeals because you won't be fixing it on remand. Um, I would like to fight it, but I'm, I'm not going to. Um, I think it has been decided. Um, I'm not sure what the difference would be um, in 22 if the state tells us what to do and what, if we had a chance to decide something happier. Um, <laughs> but we won't know that until 2022. Um, and we've had, you know, people on both sides. I'm, I'm very conscious of the neighborhood desires to have owner occupancy requirement. I, I think that that's 
what I would choose. Um, I don't know where we're gonna put all those cars. So what's coming up next week, I'm kind of feeling like the decision has been made for us. And I also hear a lot of people, and this is, this is what the state has told us to do. This is what we want. So I think I have to go forward with what the state is telling us to do. Although I sure wouldn't mind um, fighting them about this preemption, but then are we giving all our legislature time from Ethan for fighting this and maybe not working on some other things that are critical? So once again, it brings up a lot of dilemmas. Um, that's what I'm thinking. Thank you. Thank you. And I have Mike down for a second round, but I, I just want to interject that I did not, the motion does not say anything about 2021. It doesn't, it doesn't require us to keep fighting in the 2021 legislature. I'd also like to mention that this passed by one vote. Mike. Thank you, but Betty. <clears throat> um, couple things. I, I'm not an attorney and I, not sure I even read the final version when I read this, but um, if you have it in front of you, I have a section 13 question there. Um, and I don't know if this is too specific a question for you to answer right now. But my reading of that was that <clears throat> the state's going to produce, the, the governor upon signature is gonna have the agency produce a model um, ordinance essentially for application across across municipalities and that and this is a piece my reading was that goes into effect until such time as cities adopt their own how did I can you help me with how I misread that um. I'm seeing you shake your head, so I'm guessing I did. Well, and, and it sounds like, and maybe we can talk a little bit offline, because Section 13 now is about the, actually the CCNR provision. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I missed, I'm sorry, I missed that. It, was, it wasn't Section 13 then. The, the provision that it does direct them to develop model ordinance that would apply, right. but the, the, the controlling provision that, leads to this separate conclusion, which is we have until June 30th, 2022, is it talks about we they shall adopt um, regulations or amend its comprehensive plan to implement section two, which is all kind of the substance, right. uh, no later than June 30th, 2022 for each local government. Right. And then subsection three says, a local government that has not enacted within the time period under subsection one shall directly apply the model ordinance developed so that means until we've, um, until that time, and let's say on June 29th, we've adopted it, then we've never been in the position of having to apply the model ordinance. Yeah, again, I thought it's the way that language reads, I thought it was until such a time as we have ours adopted, the model ordinance would be in effect upon governor's signature. No. Okay. All right, lastly with CCNRs on 13 there. My sense of this is that that's going to be litigated. Would you tend to agree? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, possibly, yeah. Okay. It's a unique provision. Yeah, and I, well, it, it, it talks about it in an ex post facto way. It says any, you, you can't uh, enforce previ previously existing contracts, essentially. And I think that's likely to get challenged in court personally, but that's not here nor there. My point is I, I've talked to enough people, I think that's probably the case. I think a good deal of this will be challenged in court. I, I'm willing to vote in favor of Betty's motion because I think that whether it's the, na the nature of how this will be received and dealt with in the courts and or how many folks resist it? Are, are we, do we have any other means of resistance? Legal means? Uh, not that, no. I mean, we need to seek repeal of it. There's not a facial challenge that we could make to this. Mm -hmm. I take your point about it being one that it would not be good not to be prepared. I, I, I get that but I would like to put some effort, serious effort into 
fighting this in some way because I think the outcome will be very, very bad for an awful lot of people. So, Emily? Thank you. Um, so I'm hearing that we think other cities will um, ask work for repeal, but we don't know, of course. Um, how long, guessing, do we think it will take for us to get our compliance uh, organization ready? Um, if we get that ready before the deadline and then other other things change, is it like our, our straw thing where if we get ahead of it, we get to keep that? Or is what we decide then gonna be affected by the, the broader state decisions? Does that make sense? No. <laughs> um, I think what I hear you saying is, can you, could we kind of proceed down the similar tracks at the same time? So prepare ourselves to comply so we're not sitting waiting for 2022 to come up and, and hit us unprepared, but simultaneously be advocating during this 2020 legislative session to have it repealed. Is, is that, that possible? You yeah. can do both. Yeah, yes, absolutely. you can do both of those. But not with this motion. But not with this motion. No, this motion. So I uh, could make a motion to amend. Yeah. You, um, to, you could um, simply start with move to direct the city manager to work to obtain a legislative repeal of House Bill 2001 during the 2020 legislative work session. It just would eliminate... The, per, the provision that says not begin a process for complying with House Bill 2001, it would simply be a direction that you would like um, to be working for a repeal during the upcoming legislative session. I would like to make that motion. Is this the right time? Um, you can move, uh, make a motion to amend um, the motion on the table. Uh, so I want it to be friendly. <laughs> Councillor Taylor would need to. I'm not friendly, no. Fair enough, <laughs> but. <laughs> so you would need a second. I'll second. Thank you. Okay, we're now just, I had Alan in the line for the other motion, but I, now we'll, we'll discuss the second. <laughs> Alan? <laughs> Um, yeah, I too think this is a terrible piece of legislation. I think the unintended consequences are going to be enormous, especially in parts of my ward around the university, where uh, I think we're going to see really uh, uh, unintended consequences I mean, that a lot of us are foreseeing, so maybe they're not unintended. Like, for instance, the marginal law cost housing could be demolished and, and uh, duplexes and fourplexes and two of them could be put up on the same piece of property significantly impacting the livability of that area and also the affordability of that area so i think it was a cookie cutter approach that was portland centric and it and it shouldn't have been applied the way it is being applied having said all that i think it's a terrible piece of legislation it did pass it was signed into law unfortunately um and and I don't want to hamstring us while we try to prepare. So um, I, I'm supportive of the of the friendly. I had the same exact idea, which is just to, let's let's work to repeal it and and uh, let's get some information back about. Um, also, that would be good for the council to hear about um, preemption and where those rules are actually lie and what what the council can do about that, which is basically nothing. But it's good to have a public hearing about that. Uh, and make sure everybody is on the same page when we have this conversation. So I, I can support the motion, but I'd also request that we get information from the from city attorney about preemption and, and what that actually means for the city. We've done that before, but it's been years, so uh, it's good to probably refresh that, uh, that, that information for the council and for the public. Okay, anyone else want to speak about the amendment? Okay, the um, Okay, all in favor of Emily's amendment. Three, four, five. Opposed? Passes. We're back to the main motion, which has been amended. All in favor of the motion. 
Which, which oh. way are we voting? So, here's, now? so the motion now, as amended, is move to direct the city manager to work to obtain a legislative repeal of House Bill 2001 during the 2020 legislative session. That's the motion on the table now. Okay. Pretty innocuous. <laughs> okay. Again, now that everybody has heard that, all in favor? Five. Opposed? Passes. So, I guess we have finished that discussion. And I do agree with Mike that it will make housing more expensive for middle income people. Um, now, we're still on items, Greg. Mayor Betty, I just wanted to be clear. Mayor Betty. We're, yeah, Mayor Betty. We're, we're, we are, we, we just passed a motion to um, uh, work for repeal of 2001, mm -hmm. um, but we did not prohibit the city manager from moving forward with complying with 2001. Correct. No. Right. Didn't say anything Correct. about that, no. Right. Yeah. Right. We heard As I said, it's pretty innocuous. I just wanted to be clear about okay. it. Okay. We're yes, that's correct. Okay. okay. Thank you. So we're still on items if anyone else has items. Jennifer? Yeah, I just wanted to give everyone a heads up. I've been working with Oregon Recovers, um, which is a nonprofit in Oregon, uh, to bring forward to you all a resolution concerning the prevention, treatment, and recovery support for our neighbors who are suffering the, from the disease of addiction. And I just wanted to give you a guys a heads up that I will have that for you well before we actually discuss it. Um, but just so you can be thinking about it. And just FYI, um, on Saturday the 14th, they are having the Lane County Walk for Recovery in Skinner, um, Skinner View Park. And if you are interested in that, you can go to OregonRecovers.org and you can register to do that. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, then we'll go on to what was our first item on the agenda after items, which is the work session on the Eugene Airport. Thank you, Betty. And I'll ask Tim and Catherine and their team to come on up and make a presentation for us. Thank you for waiting. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. So feel free to get started whenever you're ready to go. Hey, thank you for having us here tonight to share our airport master plan overview with you. The Federal Aviation Administration requires that the airport do an airport master plan to look out 5, 10, and 20 years in the future for what we need to have to make the airport successful for the community. Our last master plan was completed in 2010, and this one has just been completed this year after a two-year project. So I'd like to introduce the team up here that's going to talk about it. I've got Steve Domino from Reynolds Smith & Hills Consulting. Michael Becker from Reynolds Smith and Hills, and then Catherine Stevens, who's the assistant airport director out at the Eugene Airport. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Domino for him to go through some slides for you. Thank you. Uh, at the beginning of the study, the airport identified a number of goals that uh, it wanted to address uh, during this uh, update of the master plan. Uh, the first goal was to identify what future facilities uh, and development but might be required uh, to accommodate the forecasted uh, traffic uh, to support the Eugene community. Uh, the, one of the other goals was to I identify uh, new challenges that the airport uh, has experienced since the last master plan, uh, whether it be operational deficiencies in facilities or uh, pavements that needed uh, rehabilitation and so forth. Uh, parking, there's a number of challenges that uh, the airport uh, has experienced that has come with additional growth. And so it was to identify, uh, to evaluate those challenges and, uh, and then also to identify alternatives and identify solutions uh, to address those challenges. Uh, the focus of a master plan is to identify what future facilities are going to be needed uh, to accommodate projected traffic. And then uh, one of the last goals is to develop a capital improvement program that uh, establishes, identifies what the funding uh, needs will be and the sources of funds uh, to help identify a financial plan that could be used to implement the recommended development. The master plan was a two-year effort. Uh, 
that was broken up into four phases. Uh, the first phase is probably the most important. It's the pre-planning phase. And it's the phase where we as the consultants sat down with a number of stakeholders uh, in the community. The stakeholders, uh, and I'll talk about that uh, in the future, a number of groups uh, including community representatives, government representatives, uh, airport tenants, users of the airport. And the purpose of this uh, uh, pre-planning phase is to host a visioning session which is basically to question uh, each of the stakeholders on issues that they see uh, exist at the airport, whether it be a lack of facilities, whether it be uh, poor levels of service, uh, new services that perhaps the airport uh, would benefit from in the future, but to kind of th uh, vision and to think what this airport could be or what it should be to serve the long-term needs of the community. The purpose of the visioning session and identifying what these uh, needs are is because these are the things that guide the study. Uh, we use this information in, that we gather from the stakeholders and then it helps to inform the direction that the master plan uh, will take. Uh, the investigation phase is basically gathering all of the base information, uh, what exists at the airport, what's the condition, its age. Uh, uh, whether facilities are in the right location or wrong location. Uh, it also identifies, it, it, it gathered a bunch of uh, uh, aerial information of uh, exact precise locations of taxiways and runways and things of that nature. Uh, the investigation phase uh, also included a forecast. Uh, we know what the existing level of activity is at the airport, but the question is, what's it gonna be in 20 years from now and what facility requirements are you gonna have then? Uh, one of the keys to the aviation forecast is that it must be approved by the Federal Aviation Administration. So when we went through the process of developing a forecast, it was then presented to the FAA and then we worked with the FAA uh, to get their consensus approval that they agreed uh, that our forecast made sense and that it was consistent and in alignment with their forecasts. Uh, the other part of the investigation phase is identifying what the facility requirements are. Once we identify what the forecasts will be, then we look at the existing uh, facilities. We, we've completed an inventory and then we look at the gap, the difference between what exists today and what's forecasted in the future. And what we try to do is we identify what future facility improvements are gonna be needed to meet that forecasted demand. The solutions phase is looking at alternatives. We, we examine a number of areas on the airport, land side, which is roads, parking, rental car, air side, runways, taxiways, aprons, uh, the terminal area, and at Eugene, there's a large uh, number of general aviation facilities as well. So we look at all of the general aviation areas and then support facilities. So as we look at solutions, we're looking at alternatives in each of these areas because we're trying to find the best solution for each of these areas. The final uh, phase of the master plan is to uh, develop the documentation. It documents what our analysis was. It documents our recommendations. Uh, and then it is presented again to the FAA. Uh, the result of the implementation phase is, is a document, the report itself with graphics that show the location of all, our, uh, all of the proposed facilities. Uh, and ultimately the FAA has to approve uh, and adopt the airport layout plan. So those are the four phases of, of, the, uh, of the master plan. What's important to notice here also is that uh, our study in, uh, included a very extensive public outreach program and public participation program. Uh, the stakeholder engagement uh, involved uh, looking at the different elements of the master plan from inventory uh, through the forecast, facility requirements, alternatives, and then the documentation and present this information uh, two stakeholders, both uh, the public as well as uh, on airport users and, and tenants. 
uh, we began the process by identifying and establishing two committees. The first committee was an advisory committee, uh, a citizen advisory committee, which was made up of uh, uh, local governments, planning organizations, chamber of commerce, representatives from the city and county, representatives from the state, and making sure that we have a broad representation of uh, those government uh, and, and organizations that represent the community. The second committee that we set up was a technical advisory committee. The technical advisory committee is made up of people that use the airport, that work at the airport, that operate at the airport, primarily tenants, airlines, the FAA, people that really understand how airports work or need to work. They provide the technical background and input to the study, and then we're able to take that technical information and move it up into the citizen advisory committee based on the, the input from the technical group. Uh, our study included two major uh, public information meetings. Uh, we held two based on uh, areas and points at, during the master plan where we had sufficient information to take to the public. The first point was after we developed our forecast. We had information uh, that we could present to the uh, public as well as uh, information and feedback from the FAA on our forecast. And then the uh, second point was as we developed our, al al our al alternatives, uh, we presented those alternatives to the public uh, and sought input uh, whether or not anyone had any concerns with the alternatives and the preferred alternative that we were proposing. Based on the visioning that I've talked about, we focused and identified through that visioning several key areas at the airport that needed to be looked at uh, during the, the master plan. The first was on airport land use. Uh, how is the airport configured? What are the uses? How are they distributed uh, throughout the airport? What's interesting is we looked at uh, the history of the airport. It's a, a pre-military uh, airport. And uh, over the years, it's had a number of runways and it has a number of, the, the way it's developed over the years, you have general aviation dispersed over different areas at the airport. You have taxiways that served uh, pre-existing runways that are no longer there. And so what we find out is that the facilities as we have today uh, don't really make sense for the way the airport is configured now with two parallel runways. Uh, and again, we have uh, general aviation aircraft, and those are the small single engine or corporate aircraft. We have those intermixed with commercial operations, and that presents some safety concerns when we mix smaller aircraft with larger aircraft. So as we sought the input from our stakeholders through our visioning process, uh, we recognized that we needed to address the issues of where facilities would best be located on the airport. We needed to correct a number of deficiencies and non-standard conditions that we basically inherited over time as the airport evolved. Uh, you may be aware that the community has been growing and traffic at, uh, at uh, Eugene Airport has been uh, experiencing tremendous growth. Uh, and one of the results of our master plan is recommendations uh, for expansion of concourses and also portions of the terminal for bag makeup area and additional office space for uh, airlines. With the growth comes a need for those that uh, drive to the airport, uh, improved access. Uh, you may be aware that you make a left-hand turn to go into parking. That's not necessarily the safest way to go in for the, the, the major uh, activity. And so one of our recommendations was actually to uh, reconfigure the roadway to, to improve the safety of accessing the airport. Uh, that also involves some reconfiguration of the land side area, trying to consolidate parking as best we could, as well as uh, imp recommend improvements for rental car <coughs> and uh, expansion of those facilities to the extent that they might need it in the future. I already mentioned the need uh, and the focus on general aviation facilities, trying to consolidate those and segregate those from the uh, commercial 
uh, aircraft operations. And then one of the other areas that we looked at was the, the need for expanding air cargo uh, in the future as well. <coughs> Uh, one of our concerns was that we wanted to make sure that the master plan was in alignment with local plans. Uh, so we reviewed uh, each of these plans uh, and made sure that our recommendations would be consistent with uh, the local comprehensive plans. One of our uh, scopes also, in addition to the master plan, was to uh, conduct some additional studies uh, to ensure that our recommendations and to provide the airport information to make sure that their uh, uh, process of managing the airport was being done in a sustainable manner. Uh, we audited the recycling program at the airport uh, and found that it is an excellent program, but there's also some uh, areas for improvement, uh, providing more information for people that use it so that they understand what materials to recycle and whatnot. We also conducted a, an energy audit at the airport to identify uh, ways, recommendations that would help conserve energy at the airport. Uh, we were asked to conduct a solar feasibility to study, study to find out if there's opportunities for uh, implementing some type of solar facility at the airport. Uh, in order to, uh, the conclusion of that particular study was uh, that in order for it to be feasible, it would require uh, grant funding from uh, the state as well. Uh, uh, one of the parts of the master plan was also to evaluate noise. Uh, part of this, the study is to update the noise contours. Uh, the conclusion of that was that long term with the projected growth of commercial operations that the noise contours would not grow and they would uh, remain within the airport boundary. Another element of our, our study was to look at economic development at the airport and methods to uh, enhance the use of the airport uh, to generate additional uh, revenue for the airport through either uh, aeronautical or uh, aviation support facilities at the airport. Uh, I mentioned the inventory. Uh, basically, the inventory is just taking, uh, documenting all of the existing facilities, the condition, finding out where there are deficiencies uh, or needs for improvement. Uh, one of the elements of the master plan is we inventory also the environmental conditions uh, at the airport environs. We look at floodplains, uh, 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 species of concern, uh, noise contours I mentioned, wetlands, uh, and then, anything that might impact how we would recommend uh, new facilities at the airport. So before we recommend a location of a facility, we want to understand what environmental uh, impacts it may have as well. I'd like to quickly review, review the forecast. Uh, as part of our forecast, uh, what we see here, the dashed line indicates what our forecast was. The solid line indicates actual uh, emplanements of passengers. An emplanement is considered a passenger that boards an aircraft. Uh, by the time we completed the study and we went back and looked at our 2018 numbers, what we found out is uh, growth at Eugene is uh, even exceeding our forecasts. Uh, right now, Eugene, uh, numbers of passengers going through the airport has reached 20, 25,000 uh, levels. Uh, you'll see reference to PAL1 and PAL2 and PAL3. These are called planning activity levels. And what these represent is when we plan, we don't like to plan uh, and tell airports what facilities you need in a given year. What we do is we identify an activity level and we identify what facilities airports will need once you reach those activity levels. So these planning activity levels represent different levels of activity at which when you re reach these activity levels, you then should implement the facility recommendations that we include in the master plan. We do the same thing for aircraft uh, operations. We look at total operations. We break down total operations into those that uh, our general aviation, 
uh, single engine aircraft, twin engine corporate aircraft, and then those are those that are commercial uh, operations, uh, the jets uh, owned and operated by the airlines. Again, you'll see generally that the forecast of operations in most cases, uh, again, uh, exceed your 2025 uh, forecasted levels. So we're seeing great growth, uh, great activity, the community is growing, and the airport is in a position where it responds to the needs of the community. And as the community grows, the airport is, is trying to manage uh, and provide a good level of service to the community. When we look at uh, facility requirements, once we complete the forecast, we identify, uh, based on these planning activity levels, what facilities need to be expanded, uh, what taxiways or runways need to be modified in one way or another. Uh, as I mentioned, you can see in the center photograph uh, a conglomeration of different taxiways uh, exiting from the runway. Uh, most of these taxiways uh, are remnants of future runways and they don't really serve the airport well. They're not in the best location. And more importantly, as the FAA uh, learns more in its industry, uh, they change it, their regulations to create uh, guidelines and standards that they deem are more safe. Uh, and the orientation of a number of these taxiways are no longer in compliance with FAA standards. So we look at uh, recommendations to uh, become in, in compliance with those standards. Uh, one of the major recommendations of facility requirements, as I mentioned earlier, is additional gates uh, to handle the, the demand that the airlines uh, are needing or are using. Uh, also, that includes uh, aircraft apron or the pavement that the aircraft park for uh, aircraft that need to remain overnight. Basically, the airport is out of space to park planes, and as traffic continues to grow, they're going to have a, a greater need for more space. I mentioned uh, needs to uh, consolidate parking and rental car facilities. Uh, to better utilize the space that you have long term. Uh, there may be need as the community continues to grow to uh, uh, improve the roadway configuration as well as the uh, uh, amount of parking for everybody that uses the airport. Uh, some of the other facilities, uh, one of our major goals that we tried to accomplish was to consolidate all of the general general aviation uses. And I think we were pretty successful in our preferred plan, which I'll show you uh, in a moment. In addition, in order to accommodate uh, realignment of the roadways, uh, the airport would need to relocate its fuel farm uh, to a new location. And uh, it will also need to uh, enhance the support facilities that it has, both for maintenance, landside maintenance, as well as airside maintenance. So as we gathered all this information from the vision, visioning, as we analyzed uh, the airport and uh, uh, where all of its facilities were located, we came up with uh, what we termed an ultimate airport land use plan, uh, which is our best uh, judgment uh, recommendation of how the facilities should be divided. Uh, basically, if you look at the, the image, you can see a, a taxiway that goes east and west with the two runways, both the west runway as well as the east runway. This taxiway becomes a great dividing line where you can separate all of your general aviation facilities on one side of the airport, providing access into that from the north. And then as the airport continues to grow in commercial operations, you would be able to locate all of your commercial facilities on the south, being able to segregate those different operations and then actually making better utilization of, of the land that the airport has. So based on this land use plan, we began to evaluate alternatives. And as I mentioned, we look at alternatives for each of these areas, land side, air side, uh, general aviation, and so forth. This is one example of our uh, alternatives that we looked at for expanding the concourse. We actually looked at expanding it to the south, to the, to the west, to the east. 
And these are a number of alternatives. These are just a small number that we looked at. Uh, the actual recommended alternative is the one in the lower right-hand corner, which shows extension of the uh, concourse to the north that would ultimately tie into what we term an ultimate build-out. Uh, typically, the FAA likes us to look at a 20-year period for a master plan. We know this airport's going to be here a lot longer than 20 years. We want to make sure that our recommendations will allow you to build today, and then everything you build today will be one step closer to what you might need in 50 years from now or 80 years from now. We look at alternatives for each of the areas, for land side, air side, uh, and terminal, and we develop what we consider our, our best or preferred plan, <clears throat> which is what we're seeing here. This is not a 20-year plan. Uh, I can't put a date on this. This is probably uh, an 80-year plan if the community continues to grow. Uh, this is how the airport could be reconfigured with general aviation to the north, commercial operations uh, to the south. One of the keys to understand is that uh, the airport does not uh, build facilities unless they are needed. We identify them in a master plan, but nothing is done until they reach that uh, activity level that supports it and levels of service decline that would then require facility improvements. So we have all these recommendations and how, how does it uh, get implemented. We also developed, as I mentioned, a capital improvement program. We break all of our recommendations out into uh, planning horizons, the first five years of, of uh, development, uh, the second five years, uh, zero through 10 years, and then the last uh, 10 years uh, or t through the 20th year of uh, uh, the master plan forecast. What you're looking at here are all of the facilities that are uh, recommended in planning activity level one. Uh, it primarily includes reconfiguring a number of the taxiways, removing taxiways that are not needed, installing new taxiways in accordance with new FAA standards, uh, expanding apron to reconfigure a lot of the taxiways because there is a lot of confusion in the taxiways at the airport. Uh, consolidating parking and then providing uh, the enabling projects for expansion of the concourses to the north. You'll also see some uh, uh, lines on the sides of the taxiway which are uh, the shoulders uh, again for safety reasons at the airport. Uh, <clears throat> the second uh, five-year period, or planning activity level two, really is a continuation of the recommendations of improving taxiways and airfield facilities. One of the major uh, recommendations is to realign uh, Green Hills Road on the uh, east side of the airport. Uh, right now, the road goes through airport property, and it only serves airport property, and we thought it would be beneficial if that road served both the airport and the uh, private landowners that would be to the west of, or to the east of the airport. The final phase, uh, planning activity level uh, three is in red. Again, just a continuation of airfield improvements, taxiway shoulders, uh, some additional apron that's needed for uh, around the terminal area, and then continuing with uh, the, the process of, uh, as leases expire, uh, relocating general aviation facilities into areas that are better suited for them. One of the, uh, the main questions we're always asked is what's it gonna cost? We identify uh, in our capital improvement program uh, the estimated uh, implementation cost uh, for each of the planning activity levels. We're looking at 113 million in planning activity level one, which would be the next five years or so. Uh, planning activity level two is about 11 million and then another 100 million in planning activity level three. The most important thing to understand is that airport improvements are only funded with revenues that are generated at the airport. Uh, through user fees, through concession revenues, aviation fuel taxes, uh, AIP grants from the federal government, and so forth. There are no local uh, tax dollars used to develop the airport facilities. Uh, 
So what we ended up with was a, a 20 year plan, a preferred uh, plan uh, that is in alignment with uh, local and regional plans. It basically uh, uh, adopted some of the things that were in the original master plan that were still valid, but it built upon uh, and made new recommendations where uh, the prior master plan was no longer uh, valid. Any questions? <laughs> A lot of material, I know that. For Thank you. Now we have questions or comments, Claire. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions and some comments. So um, as Tim will remember, I served on the airport advisory committee for many years and actually was a LCC flight student and LCC flight instructor. So I flew out of the airport before the runway configuration. So I never flew with the current two parallel runways and the removal of the cross runway. So I think the um, vision that you have here for recognizing that the airport has changed significantly with that major um, recalibration uh, uh, is very smart in terms of safety and bringing things uh, into proper alignment in terms of the taxiway changes and that center taxi way between the two run parallel runways. Um, I'm also intrigued by the um, idea of moving all of the general aviation into the north end. Um, it'll be a big move uh, if, if it ever gets to happen uh, for folks like LCC who are currently located at the south end. But um, again, conceptually, it makes sense. You know, I think it creates a much more efficient landscape, safer landscape, all of the things that you've identified in your presentation. So I, I do appreciate that. So in terms of that piece, um, you know, you stuck really with kind of the terminal and taxiway uh, pieces in terms of the phases, but is there is that just thinking way further into the future in terms of consolidating the general aviation at the north end, moving the um, LCC and all that there? Y yes, the, the goal would be that no one moves until their leases expire. Okay. So they fully amortize their investment and uh, the idea is th the airport needs to be able to control the development on the airport. When a lease is expired, that's a good opportunity to to relocate them if the, the sites are shovel ready for them to be relocated. So there's a lot of enabling projects that would have to occur as well. Okay, and then the realignment of the entrance and getting rid of that left turn has been on the list for a long time. So uh, is that uh, envisioned in one of the, the PAL one, two or three phase? Uh, it's actually in PAL one. Okay. And I think the image, I'm trying to go back to this one, uh, it probably doesn't show it very well, yeah. but we're, we're oh no, because this is the ultimate development, I'm sorry. But uh, we're proposing a roundabout uh, that is uh, much more safer than a left-hand turn. It provides access to all the other parts of the airport. So we hope to do that in the first, first phase. phase. Correct. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, I had one other thing to say, but I've forgotten what it was. So um, thank you very much. I appreciate the hard work. Thank you. Ellen. Yeah, thanks for the, the work on this. Um, looking out pretty far. So the last two years, uh, according <coughs> to this, the commercial airline has um, jumped from about 500,000 boardings to 585,000, which is about 17% increase. Eugene's only growing at one to two percent a year. So what accounts for the big we're, we're jump? Keeping travelers in Eugene, flying out of Eugene Airport instead of traveling up to Portland, flying out of Portland, we are offering more service at competitive prices. So it's allowing us to keep our passengers down here flying out of the local airport instead of driving. So it's mostly the people that were going to Portland. Correct. Staying here. Yes, we still have a leakage to Portland, but we're just being able to capture more of that local market fly out of our local Do you have an facility. estimate of what that leakage is? About 42%, I think it is. 42% of what? 42% of the pa or passengers in our local service area oh, go. still drive to Portland. Portland. Oh, which is a big mistake. It's a long drive. <laughs> um, and haven't gone out of the airport many times. So, and a lot of that has to do with the marketing that you guys have done to get people to do fly Eugene, which 
yes, most correct. everybody knows now is your tagline, um, <laughs> which is a good sign of marketing. The and then just to reiterate, the general fund dollars that go into the airport is zero. Zero. Right. There's no general fund, and and all this expansion would be paid for by user fees and airport and grants grant and other fund. things. Yes. No general fund would be going towards. Correct. That. Good. They'd have to go out for a bond, which would be revenue backed by the facility charges out at the airport, but it would all be right. airport revenue backed. Even if it were a municipal bond, it would still be paid Correct. by fees out at the airport. And then, uh, so then the PL1, $113 million. Um, what are the big, big chunks of that? Is that the terminal expansion? How much, of, how much, how big is that part? Is, or is that the, is that the extent? That's oh, the biggest parts of that 113 million. Yes. Yes. Uh, the the primary cost is in the concourse, the apron, the concrete around it. So that'd be extending it. To the yes. Yeah. So it you could be for an additional. You'd extend five. it initially and then build out the gates as you would. As the as demand the requires. Demand require. Yeah. Okay. The original build out, I believe, is five additional gates. Start with Steve. Yes, I think I believe that's right. And then we expanded from that. And, but the, the current system would stay in place. Correct. The current terminal. Correct. So again, the lower right-hand image shows uh, the first phase of expansion here. So the light blue. Yeah. Yes, and then this is the existing terminal and concourse. And then from there, whenever demand requires, you can continue that concourse or build new, you know, whatever the airport and community might need. Okay, good, thanks. Mike. Thank you, buddy. Thank you all very much for the presentation. I appreciate that. Um, it's, it's interesting to me as someone who hasn't flown much lately, we had a conversation about that <laughs> earlier. <clears throat> um, it, it seems to me that all, if not most, if not all of this, is around the idea of personal transportation or, or people flying, and not much of this presentation is around the idea of freight flying. Now, do you anticipate that changing at some point, as long as we're talking about a future master plan here? We feel that we have the opportunity to go after freight with the uh, capacity we have out there and the configuration of the house for with little delays to the carriers. However, San Francisco is a major cargo facility or cargo hub. So is Seattle, Portland. So the competition for the major cargo carriers is very tough. And they're already in those markets and doing a great job in those markets. So getting them to come into Eugene is a difficult process, but we still meet with them and talk to them about trying to get more cargo activity out of the airport. Well, it seems to me like we're putting more industrial opportunities out in that particular area from a land perspective, number one. Number two, you've got to wait quite a long while to get in line to land in places like Portland with planes to get in for something like that. Number three, retail is dying and more things are being shipped in right. more quickly. So it, all of those things together to me seems like we, we become at some point in the future a perfect place because there's no waiting. You can get right down there and if you've got a place for a warehouse right out there, why, by golly. I mean, Correct. do you anticipate that anytime soon? We anticipate still working on it. Uh, one of the things that we'll probably have to do to make it competitive with the other airports, we would become a foreign trade zone. A what? A foreign trade zone. I see. Where it could be tariff free until they actually use the product. Right. We stored it in a warehouse out at the airport so until it's actually used, then they pay the tariffs on it. If, if I can add, one of the keys to the master plan is to make sure that it's flexible and adaptable mm. because we really don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, if you look at the image, you'll see that the proposed cargo area is nearly triple in size to accommodate that potential for growth should it uh, materialize. Mm -hmm. And um, Mr. Manager, I pro this is probably a question for you. I just timed that perfectly, didn't I? <clears throat> kind of surprised none of my other colleagues asked this question, but as long as we're doing master planning for a city, this is a city, city facility, yes? Correct. Correct. Well, how does the climate recovery ordinance interplay with the master plan for the airport? Probably be 
question for you on are we, environmental people. I mean, I noticed the energy audit part, for example. Are we auditing the number of gallons of jet fuel used in our airport? We have, we have, we track the amount of fuel sold by our fuelers to the airlines and to the GA population. Yes, we do monitor that every month. We have records on what's sold to the to both the airlines, commercial airlines, military, and general aviation aircraft. Is the fuel that we sell at the airport a part of our CO2 reduction goals and our climate recovery ordinance? Well, we should specify that we don't sell the, the fuel. Um, huh? We're not a fueler. Um, we, we have a fixed base operator, Atlantic Aviation, that um, is the fuel operator on the field. Um, so yes, well, that's a part of it. We, we're we really, as the airport, we're in charge of, kind of the ground and the facilities, um, being all the infrastructure. So some things that we look for are how can we reduce our um, overall footprint by saving on, switching over from incandescent lighting to LED lighting, for example. That's a project we've been working on this summer, changing out our center line lighting on our main runway um, from incandescent to LED, and right. that should be a significant savings and also reduce our carbon footprint. I saw that, that was awesome. The part that I was specific about though is that obviously fuel use is by a huge margin, the most massive carbon use at an airport. So are we measuring that to know, or would we have, and is it a part of our climate recovery ordinance? That was really more of a question for the manager. The, how much fuel gets used at our airport? I'll need to have somebody uh, respond back to you more specifically on that. I mean, because I know we have goals around reduction in fossil fuel use by 2030, and I'm wondering specifically too, is airport fuel a part of those goals? Uh, well, I'll get back to you on that. Awesome, thank you. Greg. Thanks, thanks, Betty. Um, a couple, three questions here. One is, there's been talk over the years about the development of a hotel property in that space. Um, is that something that would be um, tangential to the master plan, or is that in the master plan in terms of what, what we're looking at in, in other kinds of uh, accoutrements for the airport? The master plan shows the location for the proposed hotel, which is over in Aubrey and 99 on the property we own there. The airport has been out twice for an RFP for hotel operations in the location and have not had any takers on the RFP at this time. We are revamping the RFP, looking at what we can change to make it more attractive for a hotel operator to operate out at that lo location. So in addition to that, and kind of moving, moving in that same direction, um, I've noticed over the years that uh, Portland has become saturated in terms of the number of uh, flights that are going in and out and that there's pressure on the next tier or next level of airports to be able to service that. Do you foresee um, Eugene as becoming somewhat of a hub for, um, you know, shorter flights and that kind of thing that would require us to expand our footprint even more? We would not be considered a hub as far as FAA standings, airline standings, no. We do uh, provide service to people who can not get in and out of Portland, you know, like a backup reliever to Portland at times, but we would not be considered a hub or anticipate becoming considered a hub at any time in the next 20 years. Not a small hub? No, not a, <laughs> we're actually, we're actually called, we're, we're considered a small hub right now as far as the FAA quality, or, the FAA standards, which just means we have so many passengers going through the airport. It doesn't mean we're a hub for the airlines. Mm -hmm. It just means we have a certain amount of total passengers in the nation that are flying out of the Eugene airport, so they can consider us what they call small hub. All that does is tells it dictates what funding level we get for FAA grant money for the airport. The more passengers you have, the more grant money you have. Gotcha. And then um, what other kinds of commercial retail development will be part of this master planning effort? I mean, are we looking at more uh, restaurants? Are we looking at other kinds of considerations for passengers' enjoyment or help in that, in that regard? The, the plan would accommodate 
any of that. Uh, and that's the key. Uh, actually, what's done inside the terminal building itself uh, is dependent on what the market will support. Uh, if there's demand for it, the airport is would always be in a position to provide the, the space to accommodate it. Right, we're looking at additional restaurant space and concession space, retail concession space, and a new concourse that Steve had mentioned building out in the next five years. There'll be additional restaurant, food and beverage, and retail concession space in that location. We also are, have been looking at and have explored the idea of having an industrial park out there at the airport that would help bring in some more revenue to not only the city but the airport. And the last thing is, is um, have we reached or are we moving in the direction of reaching a tipping point where uh, transit will be uh, included in terms of the framework of what we're going to be developing and, and we would have, you know, enough flights in order for transit to work? That would be, that'd be really a good question for LTD. We had LTD service out at the airport there. The airport teamed with LTD to have it on a trial basis, and it just did not succeed. The more passengers you have traveling, we'd have to relook at that and work with LTD to see if it would be beneficial for them and be a possibility for the community at that time. One of the keys is that we uh, made sure that uh, an adequate space is available should that be uh, implemented in the future. And that's the key and the goal of the master plan is to preserve the land that's needed for that future development. So then we would have a space reserved for transit should it, you know, become viable, yes. you know, in the future, yes, okay. Okay, good, thanks. Um, Alan? Yeah, I was gonna ask that question, so thank you for answering that. Um, the other question I had was how this relates to the 2021 games and I'm looking at the CIP and it looks like most of the terminal stuff or a new terminal is in 2022 so after the 2021 games are over that's when that the rest of it is um, construction and so is the question is how is this going to be how is the this plan going to impact the 2021 games where we're going to have 60,000 people come here right well Basically, we're, we don't want to do anything to interrupt the traffic flow in and out of the airport during the important 2021 games. So our runway configurations and our runway projects, rehabilitation projects are going to be done next year on the primary runway. So the primary runway will not be shut down like it has been this summer. So it won't interfere with any ability to bring a larger aircraft in for, to, for, to service the games. We don't want to have a terminal under construction either during that time. We do anticipate a little bit more extra service coming in from the airlines until we get closer. We won't know exactly what, but we'll be able to accommodate it with what we have until we can get past that games and then expand as we need to. Thanks. I have Claire for second round. Anyone else for first round? No. Claire? Thank you. So uh, Councilor Clark has brought up that question about aviation fuel sales at the airport at prior sessions on the CRO, and I believe staff provided similar answers, that we don't sell the fuel that a fixed base operator does. And right now there's no alternative fuel to fly airplanes. Um, we can't do electric, uh, we can't do biofuels. So I feel like focusing on that piece as far as our climate recovery goals wouldn't bear much fruit. And I think as Catherine pointed out, we're responsible for the facility and that's where we can work to, you know, employ lower carbon construction materials, um, reduce the number of single car trips out there. We've just spoke about possible transit and maybe during the world championships, we, it would be viable to have an electric bus that's going out there to help deal with the increased um, activity. And then, you know, other ways to reduce the carbon footprint of the airport facility, I think, would be the wiser approach. And I was glad to see that there were some pieces of that addressed in the master plan. Um, and then the other thing that I had uh, just meant to comment on when I spoke before was, you know, in the ultimate airport design and even the phases, those images of multiple airplanes lined up at multiple uh, terminals, you know, it would make some of us celebrate and others of us in the community cringe as we think about, you know, what that's envisioning for the growth of our community in, in coming years. So it's definitely food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. 
I thank you for the presentation. I, I just want to say I think it's a lot better to fly out of UG than out of Portland. It's a lot more efficient. Cuts down on the traffic jams on the highway and just a more pleasant experience. Um, but that's my little commercial. I think we're ready. For, oh, did you want to? Yeah, I, 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 I don't mean this in a slight clear, but it, I understand that, that there are alternative fuels being <laughs> developed right now. Yeah. And I have a friend of mine who's a vice president for Airbus. And uh, they have alternative fuels that they've been testing for the last four or five years. Is that is that am I correct on that? You are. Correct. Okay. So from a master planning standpoint, as those technologies come on board and they're implemented, the goal is to be flexible design a facility that's flexible to accommodate those if they become something that's going to be viable and, and, and used. So and this master plan does offer the, the land use um, in areas that you can be uh, accommodate that if, if those uh, types of services became available. So we have that flexibility. The space absolutely to be able to, uh, to, to have uh, an owner who may come in and, and provide that service. Mike? Yeah, I just, those questions are meant to illustrate the silliness of the fact that we're willing to outlaw people's use of straws. But a plane burns thousands of pounds on a standard flight of fossil fuels and how silly it is that we're perfectly fine with it in comparison to people's ability to use straws. It's just, it's the irony of it that strikes me as odd that we're not willing to, to make any meaningful steps to reduce demand management of flying, any of the things that we do with automobiles here at all. And we still, with a straight face, talk about climate recovery ordinance. And it just, it, I find it, I find it kind of funny. That's why I bring it up. Thank you. I think we're ready for a motion. Emily? I move to initiate a process to consider adopting the updated Eugene Airport Master Plan as a refinement to the Metro Plan. Second. All in favor? Okay, that's no one opposed. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, and I thanks for the comment on the irony, Mike. Um, I it is ironic. Uh, I think we've run out of time. For, do you think? Do we have time for the next work session? No, ma'am. I would suggest uh, what we will do is find another work session slot for it, and we'll come back. It's an important conversation. I think it's in response to Chris your work yeah. session, so we will yeah. uh, find another spot for it. Chris, yeah, I would really encourage that, and and so that we have. The process for thinking as we as we get that scheduled as soon as possible. Um, what I'm really going to want to be pushing toward is a, a code amendment to be able to allow this. And a code amendment has an entire process attached to it: public hearings and stakeholder groups, and it has to go before the planning commission. So the sooner we can schedule this, the sooner we can begin that land use process. Okay. I hope you can send out some information about what you're expecting before the work session. It'll be it'll be. It'll integrated be, into it, the work okay. session, it'll be part of that. Yeah. Okay, and so the manager's retirement has left some, us some open spaces since we don't have to evaluate him, so I'm sure we can find The <laughs> schedule's open to You, you oh, evaluate every Monday. <laughs> we can, I think we can find a space. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>